Hi, I'm Roberto Martinez and you're watching Toffee TV. Welcome to Toffee TV with me, Baz, Ped, and we're joined by winger extraordinaire, Everton legend, the man who was scoring from the halfway line many years before David Beckham done it, <laughs> Ronnie Douglas. <laughs> nice to see you, buddy. Thank you, Ron. Start off with, were you always an Evertonian? Yeah, the family. I mean, um, I always go back to my granddad and in 1966 when uh, I ended up going, obviously the Sheffield Wednesday game and my granddad, my dad, myself, um, we, you know, we're in the, the Evertonians end and I always remember when we went 2-0 down and my granddad actually said to me, I had tears in my eyes, he said, don't worry lad, he said, we'll beat these and you know, you're looking at your granddad thinking, I've heard a few mates, <laughs> uh, you know, we're 2-0 down and, uh, but anyway, it, he was like, we, well, he was right and we turned around and, you know, we, we know everything else is history and, Eddie Guevara running on the pitch, but one of the greatest comebacks ever in a cup final. And, you know, whether we won or lost, you know, you're, you're a blue rose all your life. And, uh, you know, I, I team that, you know, I still love now when I watched him and, and when I played for him. How did the uh, trying for Everton, how did that come about? Well, I actually played for Liverpool School Boys. Everyone goes through the phase where you play for your school and then you play for Liverpool School Boys. We were champions of, uh, of England. We actually won at Anfield, believe it or not, uh, 35,000 there. We beat Swindon 3 0 home and away and um, you know you have scouts coming I played for England school boys scored lucky enough a couple of goals at Wembley we were the first school boy team to win in West Germany uh, Mick Buckley was uh, my, my little buddy um, but you know you get clubs coming along and signing on for you but you always hang out for hopefully you know that knocking the door will be an Everton scout and eventually it was a fella called Matt McPeak he actually signed Joe Royal as well and uh, I signed for Everton you know obviously 15 and then you walk through those those gates at Belfield, which is like yesterday. Fantastic, and obviously becoming an apprentice is uh, a little bit different than, than nowadays. Well, I say now, Barry, uh, you know, we were rounded then. I'm not saying young kids are now, but I think they get it too quickly, too much. I think learning your trade, whether you're a, an electrician, a bricklayer, is start from the bottom and work your way up. And I think you have that respect for, for everybody. And you know, when you're eventually getting that first team, if you're lucky enough to get in the first team, is that you've been through everything, from cleaning boots, toilets, painting the ground, sieving um, soil for, for pitches, believe it or not, which now, can you imagine an academy kid doing that? Where Ali Catholic used to say, you know, the wheelbarrow's not full enough, get a couple of more spadefuls on that. And, um, you, you know, again, you, 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 you know, that's part of it, and, and we knew no difference at that time. But then you train, and then obviously the game on the Saturday when you were in the B team, the A team, was, was your big thing, and as I say, at 15 years of age, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a massive thing, but as I say, you, you'd do anything then because you, you, you're working for Everton Football Club. It, I mean, it is, you see what the kids get nowadays, I was at Everton as well as a young, a young lad, it's clean dressing rooms and all that, and I think it does, it gives you that ground and that they've kind of missed now because they're treated mm. like superstars, even at 15, 16, they're driving five cars when they're 18 and everything like that, and I think the whole, what it all means, is missing around. Well, I think being mollycoddled um, is not too strong a word, and I think they are. I mean, you've got to sort of, with the egos and all that, but at a young age, you know, that's what I'm saying, going back to any apprenticeship. That's why they call it an apprenticeship, yeah. to learn for two years to become a professional. And your big thing then, you know, whether you had quality or you didn't, was getting to 17, can you sign for Everton? And I know lads had a lot of ability, never got signed on for one reason or another. But again, it's that ground and given everything. And I think it was testing it as well. You know, if someone would say to you, you know, clean, you know, the shooting boards or something with, with white paint, and the next minute you'd say, well, do the back now, and the next minute you haven't done the toilet. You couldn't leave Everton until everything was done as an apprentice. Then the youth coaches used to come in and say, right, you can go now, which was four or five o'clock in the afternoon. You were playing the next day. But you wanted to get everything done, and I still say now, um, we're missing a trick over uh, maybe modern day kids uh, going through that process and uh, learning to become, because I think you mentioned it before, I think um, the money that gets paid out, and it comes very, very quickly now. And it's not just the money, no. it's, it's learning your trade and obviously getting to be, become a professional footballer, which you, which you always want to do. So you did become a professional, did you make your debut against? Played against Manchester United, which, um, you know, it's uh, not a bad side to no, start no. with, is it? And uh, it should have beat them that day, actually. We, we drew 1-1, but it took us uh, basically up to kick-off time to get tickets for family and friends. So, uh, you know what it's like being a local kid coming through <laughs> the ranks? But uh, Manchester United is a, a world-famous name, and it doesn't matter. I had 
would care with Stockport County no, no. as long as you play for the, the Blue Boys. But uh, you know, Manchester United it was, it was a really good game. I mean, full house under floodlights. We drew 1 1, as I say, we should have beat them. We were very unlucky. Uh, I actually had one kicked off the line, believe it or not, against them, which, uh, you know, what a debut that had a bit. But uh, great memories, absolutely fantastic. And, uh, you know, it's, it, it's something, as I say, from a young boy, you know, you, you dream of doing it, and, and that did. What was it like being in the dressing room, knowing that you were playing? You know, you, you're talking about get trying, you know, being a Bentley and then being apprentice and everything else, and then when you go in and you're named in that start. Line. Well, I think, it's, I think it's thinking all that time, you know, that you want to do it, and then actually when... The boss actually turns around and says, Ronnie, you know, you're in the team. And he, he, you just can't wait for the kickoff. You know, you're talking in the dressing room, some people are quiet. You know, we had lines who'd be shouting all around the place. You'd have other players who'd sit in the corner a little bit quiet. But you just wanted to get out that, you know, out, out on that pitch, get up those four or five little steps, get onto the, the Hallow turf of Goodison. And as I say, you know, everyone says the long walk from the tunnel down there, obviously going back to when I made the debut. Um, you know, the crowd were, were unbelievable. I mean, they still are fantastic, but it's when you get onto that pitch and the sound hits you that you think, you know, this is what it's all about, mate. And, uh, you know, to, to run, I mean, we keep saying over, you know, you know, time as a young kid, you know, when it's your one club and, you, you know, you've always supported them and then all of a sudden you're actually playing there, you know, I had idols, you know, from long ago, you know, obviously Alec Young and, you know, up to Bowie you know, and a few others, but then when you're actually on that pitch thinking, you know, these have actually run around here and uh, you know that's what it's all about and as I say you, you live supporters dreams and I was lucky enough to do it. Absolutely fantastic. That goal against West Ham. Yeah I, I get so mentioned I wish I had a tenner for everyone said that was there <laughs> because I think there'd be a hundred thousand there yeah. but uh, it's something that you never forget obviously it's, it's something that you could have knocked a fool you could have knocked it in Rose head but I always say around say if, if you try it you know that, 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 that's what it's there for and I think when Bob Latchford headed it down I thought we'll give it a go I think uh, Maven Day in goal still blames me for his, his England career getting ruined <laughs> because yeah, yeah. it was on match of the day, it was one of the goals of the season yeah. and uh, every time I see him now he, he always brings the points up that uh, my career was, was moved on after that. But great memories as I say, there was a lot of a lot of uh, press coverage after that, I think it's on YouTube now and uh, people always say, you know, uh, it, it's a goal but a game and it was six yards out or from the halfway line, it doesn't matter, you've, uh, you've scored for everyone, haven't you? One of the most famous moments you were involved in was that cross to Brian O'Hallett in, in the semi-final, the most famous disallowed goal in Everton's history from Clive Thomas. I mean, first of all, I mean, what were your thoughts of it? Well, people say, uh, do you remember it? And I, I think about it every day. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, and, and someone says, uh, what happens? But you know, it, it's, it's, a, it's a standout moment that yeah. Liverpool used to be known for it, put your arm up for, for offside, didn't matter what happened. But if you look at the goal, Clemens doesn't do it, Tommy Smith doesn't do it, Emma Hughes doesn't do it. So I thought it's definitely a goal. Yeah. And, and similar that it took so long for Clive Thomas to admit that he made a mistake um, it is beyond me because he was a controversial figure. And when, when you, you, you sort of see the goal, I mean, it was nowhere near his hand. It wasn't offside because I'd crossed it and knocked it back and Brian Hammond knocks it in. And in those days, I mean, Liverpool obviously won the European Cup that season, so it wasn't a bad side. So you only really had the one goal to beat them, and we did beat them. We played really good football that day, and I thought we were so unlucky uh, not to win it, not just for the goal, but, but other incidents in that. And you think, um, it's snatched away from you. We'd already beat Manchester United that season, who eventually beat Liverpool in the final. We won in the League Cup there 3-0. So I think we could have went on. And when you look back, it's a bit like Roberto Martinez now. When you get your first cup or that silverware, it adds to the yeah. things then, and you get bigger coverage, sponsorship, you know, different yeah. players there. So it, it really cost us, and uh, not just me was, was gutted, I think there's a lot of yeah. Evertonians as well. Clyde Thomas got a new car, though. That's the thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, but he got a big, massive brown envelope, so. Uh, you <laughs> allegedly. Know, uh, allegedly. 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 <laughs> but, uh, no, but, uh, but it does rank me when, when yeah. you think of, of what could have happened then. Yeah. You know, you're looking at, we, you know, when you talk about certain games and decisions, it always seems to go against Evan. Yeah, you, know, you know, you tell me when we've had something where we can say, uh, you know, the standouts that we've got. We haven't in, in a hundred and whatever years. Rob, you know? we, won, we won the league both years before World War started. <laughs> what, what, what more do you need to know about Evan football? I mean, just about to dominate. 
But didn't we get, I'm going to say, but don't we hold the record though for, for keeping the continuously? Continuous 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 so, right, so, right, well, like, right, let's, let's look positive yeah, at it. Yeah, let's take it down and we can have a few more titles. No, but it is, it, you know, you look at it through, through, through time and, and again, you look back and, you know, you don't want to be on, let's bring that up again, but it's fact. Yeah. You, you know, it was a goal. We should have beaten. I think we'd have been many nights in the final, and it could have been another FA Cup in the cabinet. I've actually seen Emma Hughes say that he was on holiday, and Clive Thomas was there, and he did say to him, "I made the mistake." But uh, and Hughes did say that Everton should have won that day because he'd only got. Ne- that never gets a Christmas card off me ever. <laughs> <laughs> Not now. But uh, no, well, you know, when you look back at those kind of games, I mean, we can go even to the '84 thing with Liverpool, and it didn't happen, did it? You know. Then, well, I think, I think going back to days like that as well is when you look at uh, the crowds because any cup game, I mean, I can go back to the Stockport game, we actually played at Stockport and it was hilarious because, you know, Evertonians, as you know, even to the present day, uh, the tickets are sold mm. next to no time. But we actually jogged out and I looked up and it obviously it was under floodlights and you just see blue and white everywhere, Evertonians up the floodlights. So we beat Stockport anyway, 1 0. But I just think in them days you can, you can get. 25,000, which we took to Manchester United. Yeah. I think you lose a bit when you have, say, at Newcastle, you've got 2,000 Evertonians up in the yeah, gods. Yeah. And it takes that away. And I just think if they brought it back, it's not as troublesome as it used to be in the 70s. I mean, crowd trouble was, uh, you know, you know not, not the best at the time. But I just think it takes it away from away games, that atmosphere when you're getting thousands and thousands of Evertonians taking one end over. You, you know, you can't beat it. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking of the opposition teams, I don't think they'd, they'd yeah. quite like it because we would take over. Um, it's Villa this week, I mean, it's not, not the fondest of memories, I don't think, when you played against Villa as, as an ever player. No, but similar, I mean, we, we say, you know, of the three games, you, you know, of the luck and, you know, um, Roger Kenyon's own goal, when he actually backing away and, it, and he backs it in. Roger never scored his own goal, I don't think, in his career. And then one for when he's backing up, and then when you look at, you know, obviously the old Trafford one when uh, you see the goals and, you know, you can go on over, over the period of the three games where the game, I think Villa started off as, as favourites at Wembley, but we, you know, I think a couple of chances then we, we, we could have uh, we could have won it. But it's looking back again where you think uh, we could have played at Wembley twice, the only team at that time to play at Wembley twice in the season, but we could have, have won two cups. And, uh, you know, when you look at small margins now, it's small margins then, you know, when you, when you look at it. Uh, I would love to be aware over the three games. You've got to explain to the kids though, and you played in a League Cup final, then you had one replay, then you had another replay. I mean, it's unbelievable. To think we're all conditioned now to have penalties, but to have two That's replays. But, but it's never happened. I mean, three, 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 well, three games for yeah. the final. You know, if, if someone looks at the stats, how many League Cup fans you're playing, I can say three. <laughs> but it was, it was only for one. We still have one. You know, exactly, we still have one. Well, that, that, that goes back to you know the Swansea game. We've got to win that. But it, you know, it makes you. I mean, it, it, it's similar what we say about Evertonians. You know, nothing. We never get nothing for nothing. Yeah. And we've got to work at, and I think that makes us so unique um, as supporters. You know, and as players or ex-players, is the highs and lows of the way the club has been over a number of years. But you know, as you know, they're there week in and week out, and, and for, for a number of years we've uh, we've had fantastic support. It happens to a lot of players, obviously. But what what's it like to leave the club that you that you know? Well, it's heartbreaking. I mean, um, the the reason why I went um, was was over Gordon Lee. He said he was going to play with two wingers. Clive Thomas was going to be on the right, I was going to be on the left. Uh, QPR actually came in for me. Um, with Mick Lyons wanted to take the two, as we turned that move down. And then after a couple of games, the start of the following season, um, you know, it wasn't the best of starts. And I thought, well, we'll, you know, you know we'll, we'll get in here. Knocked on Gordon Lee's door. Come in, Ronnie, and I was saying, what, what's going on? You know, we've made a poor start. He said, you've got to play with two weekends. And, you know, if you've got a couple of hours, you can say what I said in French. Um, <laughs> but the phone went, and it was actually Mac Breda, who were... Uh, a fellow called Hans Doyer, who won the European Cup with PSV Eindhoven, with Gus Hiddink, was actually training at uh, Melbourne. He, he went over to watch how Liverpool trained, and he was looking for a winger, and Bob Paisley actually, actually recommended me, which is... <laughs> That's it, nice, it, it, nice well, 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 it is actually, but it's a bit where, where you think it's a bit scary when you get a Liverpool manager recommending an Evan play. So I look at it two ways. He might have thought, yeah, I'm a threat in derby games, yeah, yeah, yeah. which is lovely. So I'll go off that one better. <laughs> so anyway, to cut it short, um, I picked the phone up, had a word with him. I went out for a week. We played Emerson Downsburg. They wanted to sign us, you know, which was, was, was great in one sense. 
we beat them 3-2, I played really well that day, uh, one of the you know games that I did play well, um, but we beat them 3-2, so when I came back, I said to Gordon Lee, you didn't want me to leave, um, you know, I, I want to sort of go, you know, and the local wave is cobble, you know, there's a lot of cobble, I mean, but I had a real cobble, and I shouldn't have went really, but to, to finish the story, I went to, to Holland, um, at a successful time, but the following summer, Gordon Lee came in to sign me back, and I left Everton for 100,000, which is a lot of money in that day, but yeah. peanuts now, uh, about a third of Wayne Rooney's wages uh, a week, um, and the up the fee up to 250,000. Now, I'd only been there from the October till the summer, and I thought it's fantastic coming back to you know a club that I love. So I could have signed, only because they upped the fee. Yeah. Uh, Everton at that time, we uh, was millionaires then, so uh, they, they had a bit of a go at the, the, the figure. But anyway, uh, it never happened. I had a fall out with Nack because I, I thought that I'd done enough for them, they'd have got a lot of money back again. And then it, it's heartbreaking, but again, it's a time where, you know, certain times you've, you've either got to move on or you stay. And uh, it was disappointing that I had to leave. Really well, it is a regret, you know, you're right, Barry. It, it, it is when I look back. I had a good career in Holland and yeah. eventually played for Fulham and that. But uh, I think at that time, when you then sort of, you know, the career wise, you know, you've had a taste of first team football, yeah. fantastic. And that's another reason, I think, with, with the manager. You know, you've got to be honest with players. And I thought Gordon Lee wasn't honest with me at the time. And I thought he, he could have played with two wings because you had Bob Blatchford up front with two wingers. Do us a favour, I think, I think uh, we scored a lot of goals anyway, yeah. we scored even more, but uh, looking back as you said, it, it is a regret. Billy Bingham wasn't it? Billy Bingham was the manager, yeah, yeah. but um, he sacked him, uh, funny enough we beat Stoke here 3-0, played really well, I made 2 on. Bob Blatchford scored a flying header, um, and then on the Monday, um, Bingham was sacked, um, but Gordon Lee in, and uh, I think it's the first time anyone's been sacked after a win. Is it this? Does it disappoint you the way that teams look? That, that that sort of mid to late seventies, uh, late seventies, the finishes were actually quite good. I mean, they'd, you'd be top four most of the time, come very close to win the league a couple of times as well. But they're, they're all always seen. And on my NFL, he looks at them as being like horrible times. I mean, you know, that's to do with the manager. But no, but now, I, nowadays they'd be successful. Oh, I'll definitely. No, I totally agree with you. I think that's the look. I mean, the nineties for me were awful. I mean, the Walter Smith era. But the 70s, as you say, we were so lucky, and I think your dad might be remembering the near misses. Because yeah, yeah. as you say, you do it when we lost two games to Carlisle, we should have won it. Yeah. You know, which is, they finished bottom and got relegated. So, you know, if, if you analyse it, I think it's somebody from the press done it points wise. Mm. The 70s would have been one of the best. Yeah. Because again, you, you know, you're just missing out on winning the league, but also cup competitions, and it's just getting over the line to win something. I think maybe we had a, maybe in the 70s we had a truer sense of what whoever we really are and what, what where we're supposed to finish. Oh, be but now, obviously, you've just mentioned the 90s. Since the 90s, we look at everything. Top 10 has been good. Well, when you look back at it, we've just been discussing over, over Tim Howard in goal. If we had Neville Southall, game shot. Yeah. You know, and no disrespect to Di Davis and, and Dave Lawson, but not top draw. But when you look at, at, at you, know, you know, not just our club, but clubs that win it, Schmeichel, mm. Ray Clements, Neville Southall, you need a top world class keeper. And, and we never had that. And I think that again is maybe down to, you know, uh, at the time, we, we couldn't attract them. You know, Peter Shield. you look at Peter Shield. I think Peter Shield. we were looking at him for I don't know how long. Yeah, lots of forest come in, pay the money, and the rest is history. You know, they win the European Cup. Now, I'm not saying we'd have won the European Cup, but again, it's small margins again. Yeah. One player, two players can totally team. And I've always said over the goalkeeper, they would get you 15 points a season. You know, um, you sort of look at what it's cost us now. And again, not having to go with Tim Howard again, but uh, I will do. <laughs> uh, but we've lost a few points. And, and again, if you add that up over 38 games, you know we all make mistakes. But a keeper, if you can really restrict it and have a lot of clean sheets and keep your individual mistakes down, you know you've been you've been silver with. Yeah, yeah. never shot on that. We've been there. Well, Neville sacked off for me was world class. I think Neville, going back to what you just said before, but I think Evan football don't get the credit they don't. He was world class, Neville Southall, and I say he's better than than Schmeichel was. But because he was at Man United and he was a big big day, they got more publicity. And I think uh, I think Neville for me all the time will uh, will be the number one for me. 
Weil jetzt auf der Breite jemand die Schneiden haben und dann zu Den Haag. Ja, das steht Den Haag, ja. Well, fantastic. I mean, yeah. um, going back to how lucky I was at Everton, we, we got beat on away goals against PSV Eindhoven in the semi final of the Cup. I scored, we won 3 1 at, at the Zelda Park, which is uh, obviously Den Haag. And then we played at the Phillips Stadium when you're playing against the Van der Kerkhoffs. And, you know, they had eight from the World Cup team. And we got beaten the away goal in the semi final. And, uh, you know, great times, I mean, you know, I've always said over, I've got a bit of empathy when um, foreigners come here, because mm -hmm. I had to go the opposite way, and I was one of the first that moved, I actually moved before Keegan went, yeah. so I know what dressing rooms are like, but they can be lonely and, and hard places, and you've got to go in there, but um, you've got to impose yourself on them as well, you know, take their culture, language or whatever, but you've got to sort of change certain things to, to adapt, and, and I, I, I certainly did, I mean, being you know, a kid from Liverpool, we can we can talk and mix with anybody. So I think that helped us that way. And I was not aggressive in certain ways, but I speak my mind and I used to say things. So I think it settled in more than more than most. And I still go back, you know, four or five times a year. Still go to PSV, still go to Breda, still go to, um, you know, Den Haag. But, but Max, uh, I think it's a place, as I say, um, you, you know, I think Roy Keane mentioned it, you know, in his book that he regretted moving abroad to Bayern, Munich or wherever. I'd always say to people to enhance it, you know, coaching, football-wise, it, it makes you a better player. And I think when you're cocooned a little bit in, in a club or your career, I think, I think you can uh, you lose out on certain things. I think moving abroad or, you know, coming, coming over to England, you know, I think if you mention it to Premier League players, they, they find it difficult to adapt. And I, I can, you know, I can, I can empathise with them. I was going to say that, is that when you look at the young players now and the opportunities, are you surprised that not more don't go abroad or, or doesn't it surprise you with the English mentality the way we well, again, we're led to believe that this is the best in Europe? I don't personally believe it. Well, I think in some ways we're lazy because mm. because we accept what we've got. You know, we're, we're awful over languages. You know, because we talk English, you think everyone's going to talk English. Yeah. But I think in certain ways, because again, it's here, um, you know, you're at a club and, and, and we've got 92 clubs you can get employed by. But again, you know, Europe for me is everything, and I think that's why, you know, the old cliche where top players want to play in the Champions League, because you want to play against the best, you want to play against distance, different systems, different formations, different players. You know, when we first went over there, we didn't know what a sweeper was. You know, all of a sudden now, you know, the Libro, but all of a sudden you, you've got three up top, you know, you've got three at the back, you can play with wing backs now. All of it changes. Yeah. I, I, one of the, the other reasons I went to Holland as well is the way the Dutch used to play. I mean, I, I love Dutch football, and I mean, you get um, you know, some of the books from, from them, you know, Renus Mikkels and all them, top drawer. I mean, I've, I got his book a long time ago, met the man, and Dutch football for me was total football yeah. because everyone was comfortable on the ball. When you look at, at players, they were world class, they were so unlucky not to win two World Cups. It's, it's unbelievable. But I think they put a rubber stamp on of how to play football in the right way. Again, you know, you know, not be sort of nice. You know, you know, they were out at the back with Rude Kroll, you know, right the way through, but they could all play, they could all pass nice skins in midfield, up to you know, not just Johan Cruyff, but Rob Brenton, Brink and a few others. You know, that for me is, is how to play football. And I think if uh, if people want to test themselves, I'm not saying everyone move abroad, <laughs> but, if, but if an opportunity is there, is take it. You, you know, and I think you regret it. You know, when you when you end up when you you can't play football, you look back and, and you think to yourself, maybe, maybe I should have made the move and, and learn. And, and you do. And I think that's why coaches, um, when they do move abroad, bring a lot back. You know, the, the way that before where we mentioned over David Moyes is saying now about going abroad, but. You, you know, um, if you don't test yourself at the highest level and again, different formations and all that, I don't think you're the, the finished article, so maybe English coaches and players should look at, that. look at that. Now, you didn't make it back here as a player, but you came back as a youth coach under Joe Royal. Yeah, and yeah. What was that like to come Oh, from? fantastic. I've always said over football, you can't beat football, but your next best thing is, is coaching. Not even as a manager, <laughs> coaching, you're out in the park. Yeah. I mean, I was lucky enough to work with Richard Dunn, <clears throat> Danny Caramatri, Michael Ball. Um, you know, we, we got six through when we were youth coaches here. John yeah. Ace was there at the time as well. Willie Donachy as well. And, you know, Joe wanted to play a certain way. And, you know, with coming back from Holland, I always remember Bill Kenwright said to me, actually, when are we, when are we going to start playing like Ajax? And I said, well, give us a few years and we'll sort it. And when you look at it, the dogs of war is, is sort of, 
you know, that team under Joe. But when you've got Limpar and Chelskis, do us a favour. How many played with two wingers like that? Yeah, yeah. And again, I've always said over Everton, that's why we're all ever told is centre forwards and wingers. So, you know, we were doing it sort of years ago, but we, you know, you, you look at that Everton team, I thought it was a fabulous team, but I sort of look back and, and think again, you know, if you're going to pay your money, who would you rather watch? And I'd rather watch teams with you can Chelsea's and Limpars in it. Okay. Um, well, Duncan was great. I mean, but that's what I say, 4-4-3. Yeah. So, so again, when you had the three in midfield, we, we still played with the three up front. Yeah. And again, when, when I talked to Joe about it, you know, I've I just mentioned over Holland, you know, that was... 30, 40 years ago, when the way the Dutch used to play. Yeah. But we actually played 4-3-3 here. And, and we, we, we get forgotten, you know, it's, it's all Barcelona. <laughs> all the other team. It's actually, it was Evan. We started it again. It's the first again. <laughs> uh, obviously, you've done, you've done the coaching, but you, the major thing you're you known for now is the video work. I mean, you, at every game, I mean, that must be just brilliant, that being at every game. And also being being the voice of the fans on the, on the radio, getting your points across. and. Being brutally honest as always. But, well, it is, Ped. I, I, you know, I, that's the nicest thing people can say to me is that, you know, you say it how it is. And, and I hope that that'll do. And I'm sort to you today, you know, you know you're massive blue noses, but hopefully you know that I am. Mm-hmm. And again, I don't get me, me ages of Everton no more, but it's a thing, it's, it's a passion that until the day you die you'll have. But you, you want your club to do the best. But as you said, to go to every match, you don't have to get a ticket. Um, but you know, you, you go to every single game. You you, you watch it. You're there. You want them to win, and then you have your opinion. As you say, we do phone-ins, and mm. you know we've we, we've got things where we get emails and whatever. Yeah. But you've got to say how it is. I mean, as I said before, I don't like sitting on the fence. I'd rather give an honest opinion, whether I'm right or I'm wrong, and then you come back with me and say, well, I don't agree with that, yeah. Ronnie. But if you can give us a better one, you know, go yeah. for it. And that's about opinions, and that's about. Uh, Conversation and getting the best for for everything and, and the way Everton play. And as you mentioned there, it's it's everywhere now, isn't it? You know, Twitter, Facebook, radio shows. It's just you know the opinions come from the top. Well, but it, but it is. But you, you, you know, it, it's something where you can't be a dinosaur. You've got to stay with it. Yeah. And it, you know, I think we we were talking about it before where you missed out on certain things because Twitter's there now. Everyone wants a bit of news, everyone wants to know um, opinions, which is, which is great, you know, you're not going to agree with everything, but you want news, you know, who's playing on a Saturday, how long has he been out for, why don't we sign this player, what's happened there, why did he drop it, it's all opinions, but it makes the world go round, I'd rather be it that way, yeah. than, than just everyone being robots, agreeing on everything, <laughs> and just plodding along, which obviously Toffee TV don't do, they say all this. <laughs> right, away from that. A very important thing that you're part of is the uh, your charity, Health Through Sport, which you started in 2005. Do you want to tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, it's, uh, you know, we started off, I've, I've done a lot of work um, for, for our amazing side area, and someone said, why don't you start a charity? And, you know, we were doing for vulnerable and disadvantaged kids. I've took kids to Holland, we've took them to Leipzig. Um, and it's to get the kids off the streets. It's a massive cliche now. And, it's all about uh, saying the right things. But we've done it for, for a number of years and we try and do the best things we can. But now we've advanced from kids from, you know, six years of age up to, you know, adults. You know, we've gone through everybody and anyone, could, you know, we try to help. We've got football level one, football level two, which you can take now. We've, we've been to Norris Green, Speak, Croxford. We're starting, you know, other sorts of courses off. And we do fundraisers, again, to raise money, you know, with a charity. Uh, we try to say, you know, as best we can. But the whole thing is, it's lovely when, you know, the, the same people seem to come and, and support you. You know, going through ex players from, from Everton to, you know, we had Matt Letizia doing it last time. We've done a, a tribute to Alan Ball, which uh, Mandy Keeley came, Jimmy Ball, you know, was always twittering me to say, you know, how, how things going and what's happening. And it's, it's lovely. And as you said before, everyone needs help. And it's, it's a game, you know, I wouldn't judge anybody, you know, everyone's got different backgrounds and, you know, people are lucky enough to have families and, and friends, other people aren't that lucky. So we try and help as best we can, you know, we buy kits, we buy goalposts and, and different things, which, which again, you know, if I can put something back in, you know, I was lucky enough to have a fabulous family and friends around me and, you, you know, I, I, I just wish everyone had that, but everyone doesn't have that. And we, we do things like this, as I say, to, to, to try and help other people. Yeah, and you've Fantastic, got, but just hang on, go on. you've got to carry on switching 
It's tweet. <laughs> oh, tweet, tweet, tweet. <laughs> well, well, I'm still a dinosaur, Barry. I'll have to, I'll have to listen to you oh, too. Well, you know, <laughs> you've, got, you've got one coming up. It's Howard Kendall Tribute Night. It's going to be the Devonshire House on Edge Lane. It's on the 28th of November. Uh, Peter Lee is going to be there. He's the guest speaker. It's uh, £5,500 for a table of 12. And the ticket information is 0151 264 6600. Thing here, so you can see it. Uh, Howard's always a good laugh, isn't he? Please. I was brilliant, mate. I mean, I phoned him up about it, but I phoned really first to see if he was available, and then obviously I bounced off John Bailey, who was made up, and then you've got you know Tony Kay and Derek Temple, um, Graham Sharp, Graham Stewart's coming as well, um, and it, it's it's great when you know the. The, the good nights we do two a year, and we've done it where we have one before the end of the season, uh, the final game, and then one uh, obviously before Christmas. And it's like a big thing. And the thing what I'd like to mention as well, uh, to keep Brian Le Bowen's name and Alan Ball's name going, we've got a Corinthian Award, which is in our seventh year. And the Alan Ball one is the Ball of Fire Award, so they'll be presented on the night. Um, Pat Le Bowen and Rochelle Le Bowen, uh, Brian's daughter, are, are coming on, they'll be presenting that. Um, Howard's been fantastic. I mean, as I say, he's really looking forward to that. We're going to get a montage of him playing, and obviously that fabulous team from the eighties. We've got big screens set up. We hear some stories, and we've got a special guest ped and Barry, which if it comes off, I'll tell you, and you can put it on. And if he comes, it'll bring the house down. Well, and, uh, well if, he, if it is, if it's who I'm thinking. Besides, you two. I want to. I want to tell me. Uh, how can, he'd be on the wall next this week, only as well. He'd be on the side of this, the ground. Uh, well, he phoned me. He phoned me this morning, which, which again, how how it's fabulous. And he's how are you, lad? How are you doing? Great, Sammy. No problem, mate. I was, I was. Could I just bring a few friends with me? <laughs> So I said, you've got no friends. <laughs> so anyway, no, but he, he's asking me, can he bring a couple of friends to his tribute night? So that's the way the man is. I mean, he's been a fabulous supporter for me. And I want to emphasise, I mean, I'm one of the biggest turnouts we can get. But how do we know, again, the big cliche, he's been the most successful Everton manager in the history of the club. What a good player our Kendall was. And he gets a bit lost in the old vicinity yeah. because Bowley will always get mentioned, but there was two other fellas in yeah. there as well. And Brian LeBowley used to always say, Everton's the only team that won the, the, the league with three players. <laughs> you know, but, but I would, as I say, people forget how good a player yeah. he was, and, and as well as being a fantastic fella. So that's Health Through Sport, Charity fun ride, Fundraising Sportsman's Dinner, How Ken, the Tribute Night, it is at the Devonshire House Hotel. The 28th of November, with a 7.30 start, don't forget Peter Lee is going to be there, and all the guests that Ronnie's just mentioned. Ronnie, fantastic to have you on, bringing to me your, your stories and, and all the other things you've brought to the shelf. Peter, so, if I'm invited back, I will come Of course you'll be invited, you can just come any week you want. I'll do the army one, I will return. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's been a pleasure, Peter, and it's great to, to what you do, to be honest. I mean, it's lovely to see two Everton, you've got their hands soul in, into the club. Well, I want to get across what you're doing, and I think, I think you're doing a fa fabulous job. Thanks very much. Right, right, don't forget, subscribe, there should be a button just about here. From oh, my view, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah <it> might <laughs> do. It depends what the directors do, depends what Jay does. Okay. Uh, right, from Baz, from Ped, this has been Toffee TV, we'll see you soon.